said a gentleman in the 1860s, it is now the rendezvous of strangers eager for speculation. Never was a hive of bees in time of swarming more astir or making a greater buzz. Those who joined the oil rush had no cause to be disappointed. The oil dorado exceeded El Dorado. All the rushes that occurred in the United States, before and since, gold and silver together, were small change compared to the riches that piled up in western Pennsylvania from oil after 1860. Lots and lots of wealth accumulated. We're going to see how wasteful the situation was. In spite of that, though, you hear this statement about wealth. So remember how much wealth piled up. Thus the Egbert brothers, M.C. and A.C., from a, a M.C. and A.C. Egbert, from a 39-acre farm, leased in 1859, shared a profit between 8 and 10 million dollars by the mid-60s. In Franklin, Pennsylvania, 18 miles from Drake's Well, James Evans struck oil while bo boring for salt. Church bells pealed and court was adjourned to celebrate. Now, earlier, you know, before this they might have uh, pulled up and you know, gone a hundred yards down and tried to try it again to try to get some salt water over there. Damn, we struck oil, you know, but, but now it's, it's, it's a commodity now. They, they uh, peeled church bells. Church bells peeled and court was adjourned to celebrate. Evan's daughter joyously told everyone, Dad struck aisle. I-L-E. The phrase caught on and was heard all over the world. Get this little bit of silliness. An American traveler was in a bar of a hotel in a small Australian town a year later. A sheep man came in and clinked some coins on the bar. The barmaid giggled and said, Dad struck aisle. In 1861 came the spectacular development of the flowing wells, gushers geysering above the derricks, driven by subterranean gas. The Empire Well flowed at 2,500 barrels daily the Davis and Wheelock well at 1,500 barrels daily, and the Maple Shade well at 1,000 barrels daily. Production of oil, which was only 650,000 barrels in 1860, rose to 3,056,000 barrels in 1862. So production increased by four, five, six hundred percent in the, in the c c course of two or three years. Now, anyone who says that the economy was suffering at overproduction at that time, you know, the government could have went in there and burned down half of those oil derricks and said, the price of oil is going to fall, my God, you'll ruin the economy. You know, nowadays we use a million barrels of oil a day. Uh, they were producing three million barrels a year in 1862. We use a million a day now. So the fallacy of overproduction is so bizarre. But anyways, let us continue. Actually... There were grim problems for the oil producers. One was the demon of fire, a problem endemic to the whole industry, but particularly dangerous to crude producers, since crude oil was combustible at a lower temperature than refined oil. So when it comes up out of the ground, it's even more dangerous than, than later. When you refine it, it's a little less dangerous. In October 1859, Uncle Billy Smith almost lost his life in a fire that burned up the derrick and his home. On April 17, 1861, a never-to-be-forgotten fire claimed 19 lives. 19. Uh, the news echoed around Titusville that a gusher, a flowing well, had been struck near Rouseville. Henry Rouse, after whom the town was named, joined in the rush to the new well. The gusher rose 60 feet high. Suddenly, there seemed to be a flash of lightning followed by a roar like that of artillery. The gas from the well had been ignited by a cigar or a lamp on the ground. Rouse, who minutes before had boasted that he was $50,000 richer, was caught in the flaming oil as it reached the ground, and, like others, he became a human torch. Though only parts of his body remained intact when he reached safety, he calmly dictated his will between sips of water from a teaspoon, leaving his money to public purposes, and then died. The oil producers soon discovered that when the oil came to the surface, their troubles had not been solved. Indeed, they had just begun. Where was the oil to be stored pending sale? How was it to be transported to market? What kind of price would it bring?
So here we have a situation where it used to be 600,000 barrels a year, now it's 3 million, and we're just getting started. And we've got to have a reliable way to transport all this oil, and the danger of fire is becoming more and more apparent. Uh, now the men who solve this and make this industry so safe that we don't even think about it, the men who solve these problems and make this industry safe deserve a lot of credit, I believe. A lot of thanks. As soon as the Drake well started to flow, a search had begun for barrels. Any kind of barrels were sought as more wells flowed. Casks that held turpentine, molasses, whiskey, beer, cider, vinegar. Brewer and Watson, who operated a sawmill, converted it to the manufacture of barrels, but it was inadequate. Cellars and barns were ransacked, and barrels were brought from afar because it soon appeared that the acids in the crude dissolved the glues and shellacks of the barrels. Improvements had to be made in their manufacture. Can you imagine that? I mean, really soon appeared people put a whole bunch of stuff in these barrels. 1,700 barrels sitting here and they're all leaking. Christ. How was the oil to be stored? An early method was to construct a reservoir built of wood or lined with cement. Then wooden tanks were built to hold as much as a thousand barrels at a time. They were used until the end of the decade, when they were supplanted by the iron tank. Leakage, evaporation, and fire in the wooden tanks destroyed, mu destroyed much of the oil. Now, with all that waste, fortunes were made. As I said, more fortunes than all the gold and silver rushes combined. Fortunes were made in this oil boom, despite all this gargantuan waste. How was the oil to be transported to the railroads? The closest were at Cory, 18 miles away. Now I pause here and say, ding, 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 build a railroad spur. Uh, and Erie, 40 miles away. Barrels weighing 360 pounds were loaded on wagons and hauled there by crews of boy teamsters. The roads were little more than ribbons of mud. Now this, this, this is why the price of oil was so damn high at first, because of all these kinds of shenanigans. Another method to get oil to refining centers was to load the barrels on barges from Oil Creek to Oil City, and thence transported on the Allegheny River to Pittsburgh. Oil Creek was frozen in winter and usually too shallow in warm weather, so hardly no part of the year was it suitable for this. Um, lumber mill owners uh, had dams which they opened to float logs downstream. The lumbermen now agreed to open these dams once or twice a week to oil men at the price of a few cents per barrel. So there's leaking rafts of oil coming down the creeks. Captain J.J. Vandergrift, who became an important standard oil executive, made his fortune on the river. He brought barrels up from Pittsburgh by the thousands and hauled back oil. He conceived of the idea of hauling a string of barges by means of his, team, his steamer, Red Fox, and later built the predecessor of the Tanker, a barge hauling thousands of barrels in tin-lined compartments. Industry being born, it's inspiring. By 1863, the peak of fortune had passed for the bargemen and the Teamsters. Railroads were now stretching their tentacles into the oil regions. Tentacles. It was evident uh, at that early date that storage and transportation were bottlenecks that threatened the prosperity of the producers. It is estimated that only a fraction of the oil produce, produced got to market between 1860 and 1865. Perhaps 10 million barrels went to waste. Those who controlled storage and transportation would sit atop the producers, and that is what the Rockefellers in the end managed to do. Now it talks about how coal companies started uh, worrying about oil when it got down below $12 a barrel. Uh, we skip down a bit. For $200, if you were mechanically inclined, you could build a, a still, S-T-I-L-L, -L, that uh, would distill oil, uh, that would refine five barrels a day. A fair-sized refinery could be built for $8,000. So anywhere for 200 would get you going, a pretty damn good one for 8,000. The process involved breaking petroleum into its components or fractions by boiling and condensing its vapors, the different compounds differing in their volatility. The crude instills 